Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Marriage and Kinship. We've been talking about some really technical aspects of kinship for the last week or so, and today we're going to move on to a somewhat different topic, which is love. Here are some questions to get us started. What is love? What, if any, relationship does love have to marriage? What is marriage about as a social institution? What are the effects of love on individuals? How does it act as a social force? How is love understood differently in different times and places? And then how do different understandings of love change the way that it affects individuals or change how it acts within society? But before we get into this, pause this lecture because it's time for a quick quiz, which is not really a quiz. Don't worry. In order to take the quiz, what I want you to do is head over to my YouTube channel, go to playlists and watch the quiz video playlist. It's short, just a few videos. And then what I'd really like to hear from you about is in your response papers or in class, let's discuss what kind of love do you think these characters are portraying? Or what understanding of love or sex or marriage do these characters have that cause them to act this way in this scene? The first kind of love that Giddens discusses is passionate love, and he defines it this way. It makes sense to regard passionate love, amour passion, as expressing a generic connection between love and sexual attachment. I don't know why he feels the need to say it in French as well as English, but there you go. Passionate love is that really intense feeling that you get maybe when you first notice somebody or first meet somebody and they seem amazing and shiny and new and you want to know everything about them and you want to just maybe stare at them all the time and you want to spend every single possible moment with them. And if you could just maybe do nothing but roll around together with each other, that would be great. That's passionate love. Giddens regards passionate love as a universal experience, a sort of biological, emotional, lust drunk happiness. However, throughout Western history, it has been viewed as a disruptive force rather than a desirable one. And if you've ever had a really intense crush, I think you probably know why. But it's in part because marriage was a matter of politics and economics on the small scale in terms of agrarian households making alliances to have access to resources, you know, like different fields, trading animals, or large scale in terms of whole kingdoms making alliances that would be sealed with a marriage. So marriage isn't for fun. Marriage is a practical thing. And sexual pleasure was something that happened mostly outside of marriage. You don't get a crush on your spouse. That would be weird. But from the 1700s onward in Euro-American history, in the Enlightenment, we start to see this new idea called romantic love popping up. Romantic love incorporated and altered some elements of passionate love. And it's very strongly associated with a complex of modern ideas like freedom and choice and self-realization. Romance is about finding yourself through finding your perfect partner. And it's part of a positive personal narrative that you want to tell about your life. 
It included an erotic element, but it was about the person and their personal qualities. Not so much about, you know, how shiny and magic and pretty they were, but about how unique this person is, their their personality, their spirit, their mind. And so romantic love also has this sort of sublime quality, like the love that you might imagine feeling for God. It's not a coincidence that this happens alongside the Industrial Revolution, because one of the huge things that the Industrial Revolution does is reorganize work and home. In the pre-industrial period, your workplace and your home are the same place. Industrialization separates them. When work moves outside the home, the home starts to mean different things. Domesticity becomes this sort of new, warm, fuzzy concept, and the home is this safe, warm place full of people that you love, where you can relax, and where you're not working. It's also not a coincidence that parent-child relationships change substantially during this period, too, and become much more cuddly rather than disciplinary or educational. So men worked outside the home. Women, where it was economically possible, stayed at home. And the idea of what it means to be a woman actually changes. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the European view of women is not as emotional angels. It's actually really negative. (laughs) Um, But in this period, as gender and labor arrangements change, the understanding of women's role was that they were supposed to stay at home and nurture all of the warm, fuzzy feelings that define home. Some key differences between romantic and passionate love if you're still not clear on what distinguishes them. Passionate love is a crisis. It's a potential disruption to the pleasant order of things. You have your house and your spouse and your children and life is going along just fine and all of a sudden you have this emotional disaster on your hands because you love somebody and it's so distracting. One of my favorite myths is the myth of Tanabata, which is a festival celebrated in Japan and other parts of East Asia. I'm using the Japanese name for it. But it's about two stars that fell in love, the weaver girl and the herder boy. And they were separated from each other by the king of heaven because basically, as a result of their love, they weren't doing their jobs anymore. The king of heaven put them on opposite sides of the river of heaven, the Milky Way, and in his mercy allows them to meet once a year on Tanabata if the sky is clear and it's not raining. But mostly they have to stay apart so that they can keep, you know, being productive members of society. But romantic love, like I said, is a desirable personal narrative that implies a future to build together. And if you watch the clip from Pride and Prejudice and the quiz, um, you can see that Mr. Darcy is struggling with this idea that he loves somebody who is just a bad choice. From an economic point of view, from an alliance point of view, Elizabeth is a bad choice of spouse. She can't bring anything to the household that's comparable to what he brings. But he loves her. And his life won't be complete without her. So he has to pursue her. Finally, passionate love is an individual experience. Even though it's experienced by everyone, it's experienced by everyone alone. Romantic love, by contrast, is an ideology and a social force. So not only is romantic love 
an experience that's possible, but it's something that you should experience. And perhaps if your life doesn't include romance, your life is tragic. Society, of course, never stops changing. And as industrialization progresses, women's life histories become more tied to work than to marriage as women join the workforce. In part, this is because women's work gets industrialized earlier than men's work. The very first thing that was industrialized was the spinning of thread. Weaving was industrialized shortly thereafter. Textile production, which had been a major important economic thing that women did at home, got moved outside the home. And then women were not doing it anymore. From the 20th century onward, we start to see the home itself becoming industrialized with washing machines and vacuum cleaners and microwaves and dishwashers. In fully industrialized societies, all work is located outside the home. And apart from childcare, let's not devalue childcare here, the household no longer has the same status as an engine of economic production. And the industrialization of the household means that it's not really as necessary to have gendered labor specializations. You know, I can put the laundry in the washing machine and poke the buttons on it or my partner could push the laundry machine buttons. And you know, it's it really doesn't matter actually which of us puts clothes in the washing machine and pushes the buttons. There is, there's no need for it to be one of us in particular. There is no need for one of us to be the person who operates the microwave. It's basically all the same. And as a result of this decrease in gender divisions of labor, both inside and outside the home, men and women no longer need each other for survival. So if you remember back to Levi Strauss and his traumatic depiction of the bachelor starving and, you know, naked, and <laughs> that's, that's not valid anymore, right? You know, you just go buy clothes at the store. You don't need a wife to make you clothes. And so we begin to talk about relationships in the plural instead of marriage. In the present day, Giddens defines the pure relationship as relationships that we enter into solely because we like the person. They are based on what he calls confluent love, active, contingent love based on opening oneself out to the other, talking, feelings, processing, fragility. Confluent love is based on affection and vulnerability and flawed humanity, whereas romantic love was based on the projection of ideals onto another person. Confluent love is fragile and incorporates erotic love more clearly than romantic love did. So in the era of pure relationships and confluent love, which Giddens thought we'd pretty well entered in the early 90s, love and sexuality are essentially hyper-individualized and relationships hinge on personal negotiation alone. And this is possible because, for example, many of the social considerations that made heterosexuality obligatory, regardless of, you know, personal preferences, they no longer apply. There's no need to build a household based on a gendered division of labor. And the same goes for a lot of other conventional features of marriage, like exclusivity or jealousy or possessiveness. Partners no longer need to have exclusive sexual rights to each other unless that's what they prefer. Monogamy is just another preference. Fidelity is just another preference. There is no goal save affection. And, you know, in a world with 7 billion people, reproduction is a secondary concern. 
Thank you so much for joining me for this lecture. Looking forward to your comments. Watch the quiz videos.